According to a new Gallup poll, half of workers are stressed and one in five battle anger or sadness during the day. Growing concerns about what Russia will do next after a devastating attack on a train station that killed dozens. One in five pregnancies ended in abortion in 2020. 81% of Americans say they believe in God. And by the way, that is the lowest that number has been in nearly 80 years. God, are you there? We're living in a time where the culture drives the narrative. Money, fame, fortune, power. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Does having faith even matter? What benefit is there to authentically live out the Catholic faith? In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Is that true? We're on a mission throughout central Illinois to prove God's not dead. He's alive. Father Michael, what's up? what's up, man? Good to see you. You ready to do this? Ready to do this. Let's go. So, Father Michael, I got to ask, like, when I first called you to, for you and I to go on this adventure together around Central Illinois to tell these stories, what went through your mind when I when I talked to you for the first time? I was really appreciative because I think sharing testimonies and stories is actually a really powerful thing. Uh, for evangelization, for building faith in general. And it's just very encouraging. Um, St. Paul says faith comes from what is heard. And so it's really supposed to be part of our culture to share testimonies of here's ways that God is active in our lives. And we're supposed to share that with other people. Here we are in Jerseyville. Ever been? Uh, I've never been to Jerseyville. Nope. Jerseyville's kind of like the Teutopolis of West Central Illinois. It's a pretty, it's a pretty, pretty high bar. Very Catholic. Two churches here. Town of 8,500, two churches. There's a lot of cities in Central Illinois that have a lot bigger population, but only one church. So, but they're, not, but they're not. But the, they're not the wooden shoes. So they have to have wooden shoes. That is an awesome nickname, by the way. Big fan of the wooden shoes nickname. We begin our journey meeting Father Marty Smith pastor of St. Francis Xavier in Jerseyville and St. Patrick in Grafton. Father Marty has a unique background, serving four years in the United States Army as a paratrooper, which included a tour in Iraq. Today, many in central Illinois know him as a priest who connects with young people, uses his fun personality to evangelize, and has a great sense of humor, often appearing in blooper videos for projects for the Diocese of Springfield and Illinois. A Protestant, man, that fly will not let me alone. If we go to a, a Protestant church, this thing, I don't know where it came from. To think of the countless of souls he has touched as a priest, and it almost didn't happen. That's because just a year and a half before Father Marty was set to be ordained, he had serious doubts about becoming a priest until something he calls miraculous happened. I was assigned uh, over in Effingham, Illinois, and I was on my internship there. 
And right before I had started that internship, I had really been thinking about what God was calling me to do, whether it was to be a priest or to be a father and a family, because I had a great desire uh, to, to do both. And in many ways, I wasn't sure what it was that God was calling me to. I, I went through the whole internship and there were many blessings and great things that I experienced on that, uh, particularly uh, being involved in the Catholic schools. Um, I remember the pastor there telling me that he wanted me to go into the schools and spend time there, spend time with the students. And through that experience, I really uh, discovered Christ in the students and in the teachers and the, the staff, everybody there. So there was a very, very rewarding experience that I learned a lot from, but uh, I still had that question, you know, that I've been praying about the whole time. Am I meant to be a father in a family or am I meant to be a priest? And what it came down to when I thought about it and I prayed about it a lot was what I thought about love. You know, every single one of us have a desire to be loved and to love others. And so my question was, Lord, could I be loved as a priest and love others as a priest in the same way that I could as a father in a family? And so I kept praying about that and asking the Lord to help me to see. And so, you know, the, the time was uh, dwindling down and it was one of the last days of school, one of the last school days. And the first grade class was going on a field trip to a uh, wildlife center. And so I said I would come on this trip, but I still was in my mind praying about this question every single day. And as I got on the bus to go to the field trip, this little girl was in the front seat and she said, I saved a seat for you, will you sit with me? And so I said, sure. And so I sat there and we went off and started going uh, on the, the bus to the, to the place that we were going. And I remember sitting there thinking about that question, Lord, how can I be loved? How can I love others as a priest? You know, am I meant to be a father in a family? I, I need to know. And, and, and this feeling very anxious and unknown about this, this question. And as we were riding there, I was repeating that in my mind again, Lord, how can I be loved if I become a priest? How can I love others in the same way? And so as I was saying that prayer and asking the Lord, Lord, help me to see, I remember in my mind, and this is all silent, I'm not saying any words. I said, Lord, how can I be loved as a priest? And at that very moment, that little girl sitting next to me just turns to me and says, you are loved. And it was such, and a surreal experience because at that moment I realized that the Holy Spirit had just spoken through a child who had no idea what I had been thinking about, praying about, how what I was thinking in that very moment. And it was just like in that moment, all the fear, all the anxiety, all the unknown just melted away. And there was this great sense of peace. And I knew in my heart of hearts that God had created me and was calling me to be a priest. Wow, and so she says this and what did you say in response to her? I, I, I didn't even, couldn't even fathom words. I was just like so taken aback when she, she spoke those words to me and it was just this uh, sense of like surrealness uh, in that moment. Like for a girl to say you're, I mean, sure. kids are affectionate, yeah, but that's yeah. kind of an interesting, like, I don't know, to say you are loved is not like a, common, common things like, way to say something yes, yeah either. especially and, for a kid yes and it, it was almost like the holy spirit had given her the words to say that i needed to hear in that moment that answered that question that yes as a priest you are a person of love you you are bringing the eucharist and you're serving the people of god your brothers and sisters in christ uh christ literally working through you in in your ministry and bringing love itself, Jesus, the Eucharist, to others and being there with them throughout their lives. It was just like all these thoughts connected in that moment. Like everything that I've been thinking about, all the things that I had been praying about, all the things I've been learning about in seminary. It's just like one of those moments where everything seems to just connect in a way that you start seeing all these insights and there was just this sense of peace of knowing this is exactly where I need to be. The way that Christ works through us and, and oftentimes in strangers and children and all these things, it, it reminds us that God is speaking to us all the time and affirming us and helping guide us. And we really have to train ourselves and ask the Lord to help us to recognize His voice and to, to recognize those moments when He may be assuring us or giving us strength or helping us to, to know what He's asking of us. And you know, that's, that's the beauty of life. We discover Christ and other people. We discover Him in strangers. We discover Him in nature, all these different ways. And the more we hear it, it, just as Scripture tells us, you know, Christ hears us. He hears our prayers. He answers them in the way that is truly best for us in the way that uh, He plans in His time. And the cool thing about that, too, is that little girl, that little first grade girl, her name was Grace.
Father Michael, when I hear that story, I could, it gives me chills. I mean, I've never heard something like that. I mean, the girl literally speaks God's words through her mouth, and then her name's Grace on top of that. Yeah, I was thinking about how, you know, we talk about in baptism, we're baptized priests, prophets, and kings, and I don't think we always give that a lot of thought, um, especially even with prophets. Like, sometimes people think prophet's got to be someone with, like, a beard who tells the future. Um, yeah, that's what you're missing. Well, you, actually, you're pretty good. You're yeah, pretty maybe good be longer and more gray. But, uh, yeah, but people think that it has to be, like, just telling the future and you have to be kind of weird. Um, but, no, prophecy can just be really sharing God's word, sharing his heart. And especially in the New Testament, it's, it's prophecy based on encouragement. So when I hear this story, I think of she's actually, that's the way she's participating in that, like, gift of, of being a prophet, basically, that she was baptized in a simple way that uh, God was speaking through her. Um, and I think it's also a reminder, okay, for us lay Catholics, if we are, you know, have Jesus as the center of our lives, what we're going to proclaim is going to be good stuff. Yeah, and I would even say um, us, like, making sure that we're encouraging others, you know, more than just compliments, but encouraging, being good examples, like, that does matter, you know, because maybe we wouldn't have Father Marty Smith if she didn't share that kind of word of encouragement. But even I think too, if we actually do slow down and listen in certain situations, God, what what do you want me to say to this person? I think there are times that God can give us, we're more likely to be his like sort of mouthpiece if we're kind of open, okay, God, what should I say in this situation? What should I do in this situation? We're more likely to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And when someone's guided by the Holy Spirit, yeah, there's that those profound, fruit, profound fruit he was talking about. To get my uh, Keep Christ in Christmas poster contest at kids, you know. Can I join? Keep 14, 11 to 14. Is the, yeah, you can get in. <laughs> people say, people say, like, younger than my age. I don't, I mean, do. I get like 26 sometimes, probably not 14. Unless you're with like a, like a, like a grade school class, like the younger grades sometimes. I'm like, hey guys, guess how old I am? So I'm like 55, and some are like 55. Yeah, I've gotten like 55 and also like 16. So Father Michael, tell us your story. How did you become a priest? A lot of it was just a journey of deepening in faith because through my life I was never officially an agnostic or an atheist, but I just struggled with doubts a lot and so that prevented me from really be really being fully engaged in my faith and so I had these doubts but as time went on I started learning more about my faith listening to Catholic talks reading books watching debates and things like that and it's really interesting though to hear like you're a priest now and you had doubts about the faith oh yeah totally like why do I even believe in God why am I Christian why am I Catholic specifically so pretty much any area um, you could doubt I doubted not necessarily all the time, but through that process of, of learning more, I, I came to see that faith and reason were compatible, faith and science are compatible, so that was really, really huge for me. And so with that deepening of the, just knowing that my faith is rational, I became more invested in the heart, started praying more, went to the, prayed in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament a lot, started going, going to confession once, uh, started going to confession once a month. Was, was there a moment that you realized I'm called to be a priest? It was more of a, a gradual thing. Really after my last girlfriend and I broke up, one of the first thoughts that came to me was, I could be a priest now. Which is interesting because it wasn't something I really thought about at all at that point. And I was 21 at that point. Um, but yeah, Father Mike Schmitz is a very, very big inspiration to me. His homilies, I knew him before he was cool, just for the record, <laughs> even before he was popular. Um, I was really inspired by him and I think once that opening like in my life for priesthood was available then i just kind of pursued it yeah and, and one thing what i love one thing i love about your story is you and your brother father christopher you guys weren't even talking but you guys entered the seminary at the same time and it was what he found your seminary application on your like mom or dad's desk at right home. right were you like hey man uh so uh, yeah, I'm maybe a priest too. <laughs> yeah. What was that conversation like? I don't know. It's kind of funny. We were kind of awkward about it because that's how <laughs> guys are. They don't like to be vulnerable. It's not cool to be vulnerable, as I'm sure you know as a guy. 
But um, I don't know, eventually we just, it was kind of awkward. It's like, yeah, you, you fly in the seminary? I don't know, it was, it was funny. Meeting Betty Parquette in her home, her warm welcome, radiant smile, faith-filled love she exhibits. You would never know that a version of her in the past was the exact opposite. Betty's story is one of immense pain, physical, mental, and spiritual. It's also one of redemption and conversion, but it started in college, heavy drinking and experimenting with drugs she says her life was spiraling out of control. Following that up included a years-long, abusive, manipulating relationship. But that wasn't the worst part. Feeling worthless, she became pregnant twice, turning to abortion twice. What's it like having two abortions? When your children are, are being torn from your body, and, and their life is being ripped away. Your own life is being ripped away. I mean, you can feel it physically, emotionally, spiritually. You, you just feel completely empty. After your second abortion, describe your life. How were things going on in your life at that time? <sighs> Having abortions, um, you, you spiral out of control because you're, you feel uh, doomed, or shall I say damned, <laughs> you don't feel like that there's any hope. Um, and so you live a life of, um, many people do anyway, of, of drinking or drugs, um, you know, to access um, suicide attempts, um, and just, you're, you're, you're living trying to get what you can at the moment because there isn't any hope for any future or forgiveness. A devastating way to live your life. But God had things in store for Betty. First, meeting Greg, someone she said she admired. Greg was a fallen away Catholic, and Betty says they were both seeking to live life differently. They eventually married. Years into their marriage, with the two abortions still weighing on her, something happened to Betty that changed her entire outlook. I had been reading about the Catholic Church, but I really thought that uh, with my past, uh, with my abortions, that the rug was gonna be pulled out from under me and, and they wouldn't want me. Um, so it was uh, actually pretty miraculous that I even found Blessed Sacrament Church at the time um, and the pastor there basically let me give a two-hour confession of my life uh, without being Catholic and I was I was stunned at the end of it when he said thank you that that was mind-blowing to me that he was grateful to hear my story when you hear those words you just spilled your heart out to him and you know, while not a sacramental confession, more of just a verbal confession, and you hear those words, you said you, it shocked you. It, it did. did that just almost give you a great sense of peace, of healing, just, just hearing those two words? Because this is something you were not expecting to hear. Oh, I wasn't expecting that at all. And it, and it was affirming to me that even as far as, I, as, as, as far as I had fallen, that God wanted me. Betty became Catholic in 2005, a sacramental confession offering her exactly what she needed, God's complete forgiveness. Today, she and Greg, who also became a deacon, have three children, two sons and a daughter. Betty says after becoming Catholic, every anniversary of her abortions, she finds herself not feeling dark like in the past, but instead refreshed by further healing from God. She has since been involved with Rachel's Vineyard, a retreat that renews, rebuilds, and redeems hearts broken by abortion. But it's not just healing. Her courageous witness has resulted in several miraculous stories. 
Betty stands in front of Planned Parenthood in Springfield often with this sign. On at least two occasions, her presence, with God's help, resulted in two mothers changing their minds, walking out the doors with their child. Then there is the story of a good friend. Eight, 10 years after my abortions, and um, I knew how destructive they had been for me, and I had shared this with a friend. And she experienced an unplanned pregnancy. And she told me that because of what I had told her and what it had done to me, and she had been my friend, she, she was alongside me, she saw how I was living my life, she chose to keep her child. And today, her daughter is married. Do you ever think about your two children and how your story and your witness is impacting and saving lives? I think of my children all the time. Um, their names are Johnny and Ruth. Uh, I feel their presence at Mass with me. Um, I know that they have been praying for me since the day they entered into God's presence. The best thing that I can do for them or that any woman can do for her child that's been aborted is to forgive herself, to accept God's forgiveness, and then let God use that witness in whatever way he sees fit and to not be afraid to do that. So you, as you mentioned, you named your children Johnny and Ruth. How often do you think about that day when you meet them in heaven? And what would you say to them? And what do you think they'd say to you? I love you. That kind of makes me want to cry. <laughs> but I know they love me. They know I love them. I would thank them for their prayers. We just feel so undeserving of that. But God wants the good for us. And all they, all those children do is pray for us and pray for their parents, those millions of parents. And I'm just so thankful for that. Father Michael, Betty's story is so impactful and inspirational. And there's two things that really struck me. Uh, number one, how God used her story and her two abortions and how she has now saved lives because of her witness. Right. And number two, the power of, of confession. You know, she felt like she had something that was unforgivable and confessing those sins, you know, first to a, in a non-sacramental way to the priest and hearing those words, thank you. And then of course, going to confession when she became Catholic and ultimately receiving God's forgiveness and how that just brought her complete peace and healing. What, what that tells me is just the power of confession and, and why we as Catholics should seek that out. Right. There's a, a great wisdom and beauty of the sacrament. You know, we as experience shows us that when we just kind of do things ourselves, we don't have that same release. It doesn't require that same ownership. So I think everyone should confess their sins to God just in their personal prayer, but to have that sacrament to say it out loud in the presence of another person really provides for that, that release. It really, yeah, fills one with a lot of peace just to have that ownership. In terms of feeling unforgivable, I would just basically share the, the basic message of the gospel that, um, yeah, Jesus came to forgive us. It wasn't because we did anything to earn it. Uh, Jesus is, is very clear that his mercy, his forgiveness is not earned. You think of the good thief on the cross? Yeah, yeah good thief. I mean, he lived a, a bad life, it's presumably his whole life, and just moments before he died, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus was asking for forgiveness for the people who were not even necessarily repentant. Um, the people that were killing him and torturing him, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And it's like, if, if that's forgivable, the people that are killing God, the most innocent, yeah, the most innocent person ever, like anything is, is forgivable. And in terms, of the, in terms of the fear, you know, there are some emotions that we have to sort of, in a certain sense, fight against. I mean, we, we, we learn with Adam and Eve that when they sinned, they wanted to hide from God. And so they, we really have to fight that temptation when we sense to want to hide, hide from God and our, you know, our shame and 
just feeling kind of bad for our sins, just to work against that. And just know that the priest is, is not there to judge you. Like it brings priests a lot of joy to see people be courageous. And even if someone has a really big sin, it's just an even more of a beautiful thing because they're bringing that to confession. And so confession is, is always, always a place of victory. And yeah, there's some, maybe some hesitation and fear we have to go through, but there's so much peace on the other side. Greetings again. Father Michael. What's up, man? Peoria. We're off. Peoria. You know I've actually never been to Peoria. I've never been to Peoria. I am not a man who is well-traveled. What plays in Peoria? Here we go. You know, Father Michael, one of my favorite things about the Catholic faith are the saints. Top five favorite saints. Who do you got? Who's on your list? You know, it's like picking a favorite child. It's like kind of hard. All right, I'll go first. My five, St. Anthony, patron saint of lost things. The amount of times I've turned to him because my children have lost things, including glasses. I found them in bushes before, which is like, you, I don't know how I found them. I found them, obviously, because St. Anthony comes. The guy comes through all the time. He is incredible. Yeah. St. Michael, I'm a big archangel guy. St. Michael, obviously protector. St. Gabriel, um, I turn to uh, him for uh, communication because that, that's obviously the field I'm in. Um, obviously he was the, the archangel who came to Mary and said, you're gonna be the mother of the Lord. St. Raphael, I think he's underutilized a lot. Um, he's the patron saint of healthcare. So when people are sick, I turn to St. Raphael and ask St. Raphael to pray for them. And then St. Gianna, as a mother, as a, as a father of four, she being a mother of four, I turn to her a lot, especially when my kids are sick because she's also a pediatrician. So I figure yeah. she knows what we're going through when my wife and I are at our wits end and everyone's sick. All right, what sure. about you? Okay, kind of basic, but St. Teresa of Sioux. I know she's like everyone's favorite saint, but- um, She wasn't on my time. Well, yeah, well, you're wrong, so no, it's good. <laughs> um, yeah, just her, her invitation to confidence in the Lord, her little way is just amazing that everyone can be a saint. Uh, saint Augustine's really cool because he's he's profound and, and theological, um, but he's also very relatable, especially his confessions. He's very modern. I don't feel like I'm reading someone from centuries ago. Like I feel just more connected to the past. Uh, so that's two. Third, Saint Paul. I just love how hardcore Paul, Saint Paul is. Like he is the real deal. I mean, just all the stuff he experienced, he's just all in for the gospel. Um, Pope St. John Paul II, just to kind of- Love me some JP too. Who, yeah. do, who doesn't love JP too? Right, just a, just a variety, you know, very prayerful, very intellectual. Um, he also is very down to earth. And the fifth, I'm, I'm gonna go with St. Mary Magdalene. I think that's awesome that she was the first witness to the resurrection. I just, I don't know, I think it's cool that some ordinary woman is like sharing with the apostles about the resurrection. I think that's just, just really cool. Walking into the home of the Engstroms in Washington, just outside Peoria, you'll immediately realize this is a family of faith. Parents Bonnie and Travis Engstrom and their eight children. While you can find scenes of family love like this one in many homes, you won't find a story like the Engstroms anywhere in the world. It's a story that involves their Catholic faith, their son, James, the late Archbishop Fulton Sheen, a former priest of Peoria, and a church approved miracle that defied science and medicine. The story begins on September 16, 2010, when James Fulton was born at home. Everything seemed beautiful and perfect and peaceful. Um, I, w I went into labor and it just, everything, again, it just seemed absolutely like it was bathed in prayer. Um, we felt like we were on the cusp of something great and um, everything was going along just perfectly. And it wasn't until my son was delivered that, that we realized that we were completely wrong. And your son came out and he wasn't breathing. 
Immediately, I knew that sometimes babies needed to be stimulated to wake up to take their first breath. So I wasn't super nervous right away. We had professionals in the room, but when they started to become worried, we started to become worried. And my midwife took my son from my hands and she laid him on the ground, started CPR. We had a friend who was present, um, a former NICU nurse, and she knew the situation was bad. So she left to call 911. What's going through your mind now seeing your lifeless child there and you probably feel completely helpless and obviously beyond yes. worried and, and freaking out. I was actually shutting down and going into a state of shock. I wasn't able to process what was happening in front of me, but I have a distinct memory of watching my husband do an emergency baptism on our son and of also sitting and saying in my head Fulton Sheen's name over and over again, Fulton Sheen, Fulton Sheen, Fulton Sheen. I think because I was in a state of shock, I just could not find any other words except to call on the name of the man whom I had already entrusted my son to during my pregnancy. The Engstroms rush James to the hospital, continuing to call on Fulton Sheen to intercede for them, needing a miracle. At the hospital, the medical team did everything they could to restart James's heart. There came a point where the neonatologist said, try for five more minutes and then call it. So they tried for five more minutes and nothing happened. And so everyone stopped working on James to call time of death. And it was at that moment when all hope was gone and all hands were off that James's heart started to beat again. It was 61 minutes from the time James was born until his heart miraculously started beating. James was taken to the NICU, and there, doctors painted a grim picture. Because James didn't have a heartbeat for such a long time, it was expected his organs would fail at any minute, and he wouldn't survive. Still calling on the intercession of Fulton Sheen, James again miraculously made it through and not only did he survive, he ended up being fine. There came a point where a nurse said to us, Bonnie, he's just a normal baby and he needs to go home from the NICU and do normal baby things. And, and that was just the first time in seven weeks anyone had called my baby normal. And that was when we really knew the miracle had happened. You know, all, these, all this time of praying for Fulton Jean's intercession and the miracle had happened. The Diocese of Peoria investigated the miraculous healing interviewing the doctors, nurses, family, among others. No one had a medical explanation. Those findings were sent to Rome, where medical experts who advised the Congregation for the Causes of Saints agreed. There was no medical or scientific explanation for what happened. It was a miracle. Theologians then unanimously approved that the miracle was attributable to the intercession of Fulton Sheen. Those findings were sent to Pope Francis, who on July 5th, 2019, approved James's miracle for Archbishop Fulton Sheen's beatification. Not every family has the miracle approved by the Pope. No. <laughs> What's that like? Um, it's very surreal. <laughs> it's incredible. I We were actually woken out of bed with the news and it was just, you know, one of those things where you're like, you can't stop smiling all day long. I love this picture because it's like it remembers about me like praying for, to Fulton Sheen I fair battle. Yeah. About me. Do you still pray to Fulton Sheen for help sometimes? Yes. I think that my family is extraordinarily ordinary. Um, we're just, you know, we're just like everyone else on the block. There's a little bit more kids in our family, but otherwise, um, and I think that's the one of the beautiful things about it is that Jesus Christ is still active today. He still cares about us and he is listening to our prayers. When you look back on this story and you think, didn't breathe for 61 minutes, doctors are about to declare him dead. Even when he does start to breathe again, doctors say he's probably not gonna make it or have a very poor quality of life and now here we are, what goes through your mind? Gratitude. Um, and a, a, a smallness, I feel very small and unworthy of this gift, but um, 
God is really good. One of the messages is that every life matters, um, that our God is still raising people from the dead. Miracles of biblical proportions are still happening. And, um, and I think the number one thing that I want people to take away is that Fulton Sheen is not the person, is not the one who brought James back from the dead. It was Jesus Christ who brought James back from the dead. And um, Fulton Sheen played a very special part in that. But that's just the power and the beauty of the community of saints, that we are all connected in, in the body of Christ. Father Michael, that story, obviously incredible. I mean, the child didn't breathe for 61 minutes and, and he made it out and right. of course he's doing fine today. There's so many things about that story that resonate with me. Number one, uh, that miracles do happen. And these, you know, we think about miracles, sometimes we think, oh, they happened centuries ago or they can't right. happen anymore. Well, no, they very much do happen today. I mean, this event happened in 2010 and they don't happen in faraway places. They can happen in our own lives. Right. This happened in our own backyard. And then finally, just turning to heaven for help. Right. Yeah. And we do as Catholics believe in the communion of saints. And people can wonder, why would I go to anyone but Jesus? Because Jesus is God. The reality is that Jesus made it abundantly clear that he doesn't want to do things by himself. Jesus wants to empower his disciples to do what he did. Okay. And yeah, in the Gospels. Jesus sends them to his disciples to share the share the gospel and heal people and and deliverances. So he's empowering them to do what he did. And so when it comes to those who have gone before us in heaven, it's not like their ability to, to help is is taken away. If people still have powerful prayers, they can still help us. And sometimes we treat heaven as this very far away place that we have no contact with that's at the edge of the universe. And that's not really accurate. Uh, Heaven is actually mysteriously very close to us. And sometimes, you maybe have heard this phrase where people say that the veil is thin. That the veil between heaven and earth is thin. So God and the saints and angels are not actually far away. There's, there's a mysterious way they're actually very close to us and they're uh, involved with us. And so if we have the faith to reach out to them, we can uh, receive their help. Father Michael. Andres. What's up, man? What's your name in Spanish? Andres. You gotta twirl the R. I don't think you rolled an R, actually. And 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 res? And I don't res. think I don't think it's a double R. No, no. You would know, I could, you would know I, better than me. I could be wrong. Hey, Quincy today. Quincy's near and dear to my heart. My grandparents are from here and my first job here. All right. The Gem City. It's a it's a land island. I always say that's a, it's a land island. It is it's, out, kind of out there. I always floor. forget how far away it is from everything. Let's go. Your father Michael when I think of Quincy, I think of our own father Augustine Tolton who's on his way to sainthood. Of course, he made a, a daring escape across the Mississippi River, born a slave with his family, settled in Quincy, um, where he grew up, and then he went off to Rome to study to become a priest. And then, uh, you know, he ministered in Quincy, then he went to Chicago, and of course now he's buried here in the Gem City. But when I think back to his story, what gives me chills all the time is hearing this story. When he was in seminary and about to be ordained a priest, he thought he was going to go to Africa mm -hmm. to minister there. And the cardinal who was in charge of his ordination took him aside and said, you know, America has been called the most enlightened nation on earth. We'll see if it deserves that honor. And if it hasn't seen a black priest, it must see one now. Wow. Can you imagine, can you imagine getting that right before your ordination date? Um, and then of course he comes here to Quincy and he, about like half the town showed up to, to welcome him with open arms. Um, and just his story is just, it's so powerful. And, and just, you know, again, on his way to sainthood, and I think he's such a model for us today. Absolutely. Yeah, I just, I really think of his perseverance. I mean, just the, the difficulties he faced, and I think there was, I think he had difficulties with a, another priest in town and just experiencing discrimination and just, yeah, how he persevered through, through all those challenges, just in the midst of, of so many obstacles.
Days before their first child, Hope, was born in 2008, Bill and Sarah Reichert of rural Adams County learned their daughter had a major brain malformation, later learning it was a Cardi syndrome, a rare disorder that results in the partial or complete absence of an area of the brain that connects the left and right side of the brain. When you received the news about Hope's condition, what went through your mind and your husband's mind? We had went to um, the doctor and she said, I want another ultrasound because I think the baby's not growing. Um, so we had one in town and there was all this black space in her brain. I mean, I even I knew it wasn't good. Um, at three months old, the seizure started. At a five months old, we had a diagnosis. Um, and I, I hit complete and total darkness. Um, we, you know, I remember we went to a healing mass. You know, and I remember taking her up. So you're, you're hoping for a miracle. I was hoping for a miracle. That miracle didn't come. Today, Hope needs full-time care. She can't walk, can't talk, can't feed herself, among the other typical things a girl her age should be able to do. But leaning on their Catholic faith, the Reicherts embrace their daughter and their situation. Achoo! Achoo! <laughs> There's so many people in your situation who would turn away from God. Why ultimately did you cling to him? Because I think so many people would, would, would feel hopeless in a sense. So what gave you the perseverance to ultimately say, God, I'm actually going to trust you and, yeah. and, and be with you? All I can tell you is grace. Maybe I was lukewarm before. You know, I, I think somebody said once, faith isn't faith until it's dropped you to your knees. And, you know, I, I prayed all the time. I talked to God all the time through that. She has let me love differently. Prior, prior to hope, I, you, know, I, you know, I teach high school math and I like the advanced stuff. And if students were in my room who, who struggled, I would necessarily sometimes fight it. They weren't, they weren't meant to be in my room. And I think I, as a very shallow young woman, I, I equated intelligence and worth. I think that realizing that her worth is because she is, she is, not because of what she can do or what she can't do. And so then, you know, the way I looked at the world and the way I treat people changes. On Sunday morning, you will find the Reicherts getting ready for Mass at St. Francis Solanus Parish in Quincy. It's time consuming, it's difficult work, and it can be frustrating. But coming here, they would never miss it. Being with other families, hearing the Gospel message, and receiving Jesus truly present in the Holy Eucharist. It takes you guys 60 to 90 minutes to get ready to go to Mass. We're 30 minutes from Quincy. It's big production. So many people aren't even going to Mass, yet you do, and you go through the production of it every Sunday. Why? Hope is happiest at Mass. Um, Hope knows she's at Mass. Hope, Hope knows how to worship. And if I'm going because I need the Eucharist and I need to go to Mass, why wouldn't she? Um, and you know what, she sings it. I mean, she's, she is lively at Mass. And when I take Hope up to receive the Eucharist and it's presented to her and she opens her mouth, she knows, she knows. And you know, it's, it's a lot of who am I to keep it from her? And I don't know, there's nothing, there's nothing like going to Mass for us. What's your message for families who have fallen away from the faith because of hardships, who feel hopeless? You know, my, my faith tells me that it's okay, that you're gonna be, even things, are, things can be terrible, but it's still, it's still okay. And no matter what you do or what you've done, God is gonna love you and hold you through it, but you, you've gotta let him back in. How often do you think about heaven with hope? And what's that scene like when you see her and she runs to you for the first time and she talks to you for the first time and what do you think her, her words would be? I think, 
I don't think about it daily. It's when she gets sick. And I think maybe we're getting closer. Um, and uh, like I said, I know, I know where she's going. And I, I still believe I'm, we're gonna get there, that I'll get there too. When I get there, I'm gonna run for her and we'll, uh, we'll embrace standing up. And her being able to squeeze me back and I, I hope, I hope she tells me thank you. You know what, I, that I know you did your best. That, that's what I hope for. And, and I, I envision she's gonna have to stand up for me and she's gonna have to let him know I'm with her. Wow, Father Michael, the Riker, it's such an incredible, inspirational story. Yeah. Uh, two things immediately jump out to me, meeting them and being with them. First of all, to not take things for granted. Sure. I mean, myself raising four boys, boy, I feel like I go through a lot of struggles every <laughs> night, um, trying to raise them, trying to feed them, get them ready for school, you know, all that sort of stuff, you know, parents can relate. But to remember to have that check that, you know, there's other people out there that are, that are having more struggles than I am. And their story is just, it's just a good reminder, I think, that just says, you know, don't take things for granted because sure. my children can talk to me. They can, they can walk, they can have fun, I can listen to them. And, you know, they don't have that with hope. Right. Um, so again, have that reality check that, that Tanat not takes things for granted. Um, also just their profound faith. Wow, talk yeah. about an uplifting and inspiration. Yeah, and to see that they've not grown cynical. Like, suffering can be this thing that some people respond to it without hope <laughs> they respond to it without hope and they grow they grow cynical they grow distant from god and see how this has drawn them closer to god and it's really brought about a profound transformation transformation i know like seeing sarah just profound character profoundly just amazing character just to see too just how much joy she experiences you know she's a very i mean i know talking with sarah just to see her, her joy in the midst of this pretty difficult situation that she has as joy and I thought of Hebrews there's a verse from Hebrews that says for the sake of the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross and just to know that yeah just to see that joy that which Sarah had was really awesome and also too the other thing that really impacted me was uh, just how much they they treasure her and that speaks to the dignity of the human person that even if someone's not able to talk, not able to interact like you and I can interact, that there's this profound um, sense of the dignity of the human person. Hello. What's up, Father Michael? Hey. Back to your old stomping grounds. Back to my old stomping grounds. Your first assignment as a priest. That's right. You know what, I'll actually get to show you around because usually I know absolutely nothing. And now I can tell you something. Actually, I probably don't actually know, even know that much, but <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty clueless. The Soy City, here we come. You asked me my story, so just, yeah, how did you and your wife meet? And yeah, like, how was, How's marriage been for you as a vocation? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Every time I write in a letter to my friends who get married, I always put marriage is awesome. Marriage has been awesome, I love it. It's kind of an interesting story meeting my wife because when I was in college, I wanted to get into radio. Uh -huh. um, I was a, like a TV radio broadcasting major. <clears throat> and the story is the summer before my senior year, I went to Scotland with my two brothers and my dad. <clears throat> and literally as we're walking into a course a guy with a Notre Dame sweatshirt is walking out. And my dad and brother went to Notre Dame, so they, they of course struck up a conversation. Oh, Notre Dame, we're in Scotland, this is great. Turns out this guy does radio and TV in South Bend, Indiana. So I told him, oh, I go to Valparaiso, and I'm interested in radio. Could I ever come meet with you and talk with you about radio? Sure, come on up, and you know, I'd love to talk. So I went to the TV studio, because he's like, hey, I actually do the weekend weather 
at the NBC station there, so why don't you come talk to me there about radio? So I go there, and that was my first time going into a TV studio, and wow. I was just, I fell in love with it. I thought it was so wow. cool. So after, I, after he does his broadcast, I then am now talking to him about TV, not radio. So I wanted to get into TV so bad. So after my senior year, I had no TV experience. I went to Quincy and worked at the NBC station there. Um, and then from there, after a year later, uh, I then came to work at ABC in Springfield. And it was at what was then called the Young Adult Mass. It was a mass for, obviously, young adults in Springfield. Um, lo and behold, my wife, who was a student at Benedictine University, was there. And you know, the rest, they say, is history. But what's so interesting, when I think back about that, that story, and I think this is for all of us, Father Michael, is I wouldn't have met my wife if I didn't meet a random guy in Scotland. Because if I don't meet him, I don't, go to, I don't go into television, which means I don't go to Quincy, which means I don't go to Springfield, which means I don't meet my wife. I remember a deacon said to me once that God's never going to lead you toward a disaster if you pray and put your trust in God and you know, God, where are you leading me on this journey? And I think back over all those decisions I made, do I go into TV, do I go to work to Quincy, do I go to work in Springfield? And some agonizing decisions I had on where I want my career to go. And ultimately, he of course knew what was best for me. And had I not made those decisions, I wouldn't have met my wife. Yeah. Wouldn't have had four kids. Yeah. So that's that could lead to like anxiety. Like all these factors have to be in place, but it should just really invite us to say like, hey, stop trying to figure things out. You know, go where God is calling you in the moment, and you just have to trust Him to arrange everything. Because you couldn't have like calculated that. Like, well, I'm gonna do this and this. It's just God's providence, like providing for you and your and your vocation. So that's, that's beautiful. Since Grant Wilson was born, he had a condition where his legs grew at different rates. This caused him frequent, strong back pain due to the severe misalignment, about an inch and a half, he says. Surgery wasn't an option, doctors recommending against it. A lift in one of his shoes helped, but the pain persisted. Grant knew about Night of Healings in central Illinois, led by none other than Father Michael Trummer. This is where trained prayer teams pray over individuals who are in need of physical healing. In November 2021, Grant entered a night of healing at Our Lady of Lords in Decatur, hoping God would make the pain stop. Kind of walk us through what happened. Yeah, for sure. So I was, you know, we were all praying and like kind of like waiting to be prayed over. So I come up here and there's Michael and Barb, two like prayer team volunteers sitting here. Um, so I sit down and they, I think I popped my shoes off or whatever. They looked at the difference between my legs to see like, okay, it's an inch and a half or whatever it was. And it's like this much, they can visually see it. So I sit down um, and Michael says, hey, like, how did this start? Okay, it's from birth. Um, is there anyone, and then he first said like, is there anyone that you think that you need to forgive before we start praying? Like that lack of forgiveness could stop, you know, God's gifts coming through. So we, I prayed for someone that I had been thinking about. Then he said, um, okay, let's start praying. So he like picked up my left leg, the shorter one, and he starts very expressively praying like oh, bones and ligaments and tendons in the name of Jesus, be healed. Um, and I was like, you know, praying along with him in my head. Mm -hmm. And he's like, do you feel anything? And I said, no, it's, it looks the exact same. Oh, well, thanks for trying. Yeah. And he's like, no, 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 we try a few times. Like sometimes God wants us to persevere. Sure. So he picked, up, he picked up the left leg again, um, and then Barb prayed this time, so the other volunteer, and she said the, kind of the similar thing, like bones and blood vessels and ligaments and tendons grow in the name of Jesus. And then, all the, then I heard this little gasp from Michael, like, <gasps> In that moment, the team realized something different. They measured Grant's legs and found them to be nearly even. Did you feel much during the time of prayer or even after, or was it, was it the change is kind of subtle and you just noticed that the, the length was different? The change for sure was subtle. 
Um, I'd say the only thing I felt was just like a lot of warmth. What was your reaction to that scene that it had clearly, um, clearly moved an inch, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but what was your reaction to that? Like, yeah, I think it was like if I had won the lottery, like a similar reaction. Someone says like, you have a million dollars now. I was like, uh, uh, what? Like it, something actually happened? Michael Nolan, a friend of Father Michael's who lives in South Bend, Indiana, was the one Grant talked about who gasped. Michael does healing ministry and says he has witnessed many healings, but remembers this story vividly. He said that when they measured Grant's legs and saw the growth, he just about fell over. In that moment, when you measure Grant's legs, what's your reaction? What's going through your mind? It absolutely blows my mind because it, because it really, it's. Um, I don't think it's something we should ever get used to. I think it should be. You know, there's a wow factor with God. He is awesome, <laughs> and uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget that moment. Just like <laughs> you are amazing, Lord. Just. It's kind of like uh, astounding me all over again. Showing us a knee brace and a back band he used to wear. Today, Grant's back pain is gone. I went to my parents' house because um, I think we were having dinner or something like the next day. And I was like, hey, mom, I'm, like, I don't want to tell you why I'm asking you this. I understand it's a weird question, but just like observe me walk down like this hallway and tell me if it looks any different. And so she's like, okay, whatever. So I walk and then she says, yeah, like your, your gait used to be kind of like ba bum ba bum ba bum And now it's like 90% more even. And then I told her the whole story and she was like, whoa, praise God, that's awesome that that happened. Why is it significant that like you received the healing at a healing service? Like why wouldn't God heal you anywhere else? You know, maybe God wanted me to have to be vulnerable, like to tell people, not just be in my room, but and be like, God, just like do it so that no one has to like, ever know that this is like a problem. Like I had to tell people, this is a problem, please pray for me, like put your hand on my leg and like be so close to it that you can see the difference. So yeah, looking back at this whole story and your, and your journey, what kind of goes through your mind? Sure, God can heal people and God can act, but I think in my mind it was more like, oh, it's like one in a million and not common at all and only if you are like in dire straits, not just you have like back pain and some minor or moderate life inconveniences. So it was really touching for sure to, to be like, okay, God like reaches into the world and just acts powerfully. God's not a clockmaker. I always knew that, but he like goes into the clock and fixes things and he wants to touch the world directly. You've been a part of the healing ministry across our diocese for, for a while, and Grant's story is it's not uncommon. No, it's not. And so I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that, you know, I've hosted these healing services and I'm not giving the impression that everyone is always healed by any means, because that's, that's not the case. Um, but God does heal much more than we would expect. And so for us to come, uh, to come in faith to, to pray for that healing. And so, you know, sometimes people wonder like, well, what about redemptive suffering? And it seems like there's like this disagreement, like, well, do you believe in healing or redemptive suffering? And I, th I think we should believe in both. That if, if God heals somebody, like he brought healing to Grant, like I think we should give God glory for that. And that's amazing. Um, but if someone has suffering, like God can use that as well. And so it's, it's not a competition. We Everything can give glory to God. Yeah, and I would also think a grand story you think of yeah, I think as Catholics, we sometimes get we get caught up in praying privately. We're, you know, we want to stay in our head, and all our prayers are just very private. And you think of, you know, the old saying, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And that, that power of, of praying in public and praying with others, you know, even as simple as being a witness when you go out to eat at a restaurant to make the sign of the cross, are you willing to be that witness? But then also, when I think of Grant's story and the power of, of praying together, there's nothing better than the Mass. You know, that is the ultimate prayer, and that's that's where everything is. <laughs> sure, yeah, no, it's really important with these healing services to get us out of our comfort zone, to get us praying with each other, because there is a power in gathering together. It's really beautiful. Um, but of course, yeah, as beautiful as the healing services are, um, the Mass is still by far the most beautiful, you know? Uh, we have a, a guaranteed miracle every time. <laughs> 
greater than any healing is, is the, the gift of the Eucharist where the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus. Um, yeah, and we get to participate in the, in the life of heaven at Mass. We come together to, to be with uh, one another. It, it really is the most powerful. We take it for granted, but it, it really is. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Father Michael, here we are at the end. Five incredible stories across Central Illinois. I had a blast doing it with you. Yeah. What's the big takeaway you think for us people of faith? Yeah, I think the big takeaway is just getting your, turn your attention towards God and what He is doing. Because if we maybe just look at the news and what's wrong in the world and our lives, we easily become discouraged. And so turn your attention to what God is doing really is encouraging for us. And so they increase our faith and expectancy in Him. In him. Uh, a very common temptation for, for many of us is feeling God is, is far away, He's abstract, He's distant, not involved in our lives. And so just seeing little ways that God can be um, involved in our lives. And some of it was through more obvious uh, stories of healing. Sometimes things were kind of messy, but God was still at work and was at work in each of the stories. And so um, I think it's helpful just to help us to see how God is active in our lives, that He's, he's Emmanuel, that these things we say about Him being our shepherd and, and guiding us is not just something we say, um, or it's not just something written in the Bible, that it's, it's, it's a truth. And so... Um, God I mean, is alive. Yeah, God is alive. He's with us, He's active, and certainly we, we did not ex exhaust everything God has done, we've just given little snapshots, but I think it's valuable. Sweet. It's been awesome doing it with you, man. Yeah, thank you for everything. Yeah. the idea and everything else to do. After I said goodbye to Father Michael, I thought more about our journey and these incredible stories. I think God uses miracles and people of tremendous faith to sometimes wake us up to his reality. But we should recognize God is always alive and those caring for the homeless and those living on the streets in the sacraments, like a beautiful marriage, and forgiveness and confession, in the community teaming up to feed the hungry, in our religious and priests who have the courage to embrace their vocation and live it joyfully, in teachers who are passing on the faith, in children who greet you with love and embrace the faith, in families who love unconditionally, in the gift of life in the beautiful smiles of every human being. And of course, literally, in the Holy Eucharist. It's crystal clear, God is alive. The question, how is he alive in you? People, you have these random people coming to your house with these cameras, right? These r random, random weirdos and playing your piano. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Looking to live our lives differently and saying, okay. <laughs> something my teeth. Like something like a piece of lead or something in my teeth that I can't like get it out. I don't know how visible it is. But they can hear it is stuck. You are really blown out. I mean it's like But my face is okay. I just care about my face. Okay. Don't you care about your face? <laughs> Story of Noah. 
I know a guy.